We have some good news and we have some bad news. Uh, let's start with the good news. Uh, there's lots of talk of peace on this Halloween evening. Uh, could this really happen? Will we actually see peace? Uh, could the world finally be waking up to start peace talks, coming to the negotiating table? Maybe. Um, we saw some kind of pro-peace movement unfolding in Brazil over the past uh, 24 hours. Leftist candidate Lula in Brazil projected, of course, to be the winner there of Brazil's election over the weekend. Some say he's a puppet of the World Economic Forum. He's a puppet of the West. People often forget that the Obama administration <laughs> tried a coup attempt against him. So, okay, let, let's just... It's all very, very nuanced in Brazil. It's not sure. as it's not as black and white as people on Twitter can make it out to be very quickly. But anyway, Biden did congratulate him after his victory. Uh, is he a Biden guy? I don't know. Maybe they think he is, even though Biden's former boss tried to have you know a coup against him. So again, nuance. Um, some say, oh, no, Brazil just sealed its fate to become the next Venezuela. So there's a lot of this thought as well. Oh, no. This is a socialist communist. This is going, of course, lead to the destruction of Brazil as a result of it. So we will wait and see on those pieces. Uh, he's a social Democrat. I love how someone with an American flag feels the need to tell Brazil what they are. Right. According to. OK. So he is a social Democrat. He's been pushing for anti-poverty programs for a number of years. Uh, I think it's called Fom, Fom Zero, which is. Uh, Fom Zero means Fom zero, zero hunger. Zero hunger. That has been a big platform. Three meals a day. Uh, that is one of his big platforms. He's also vehemently anti-war. Um you know, and people say he's not a puppet of the West. You can ring in on this. We don't have a dog in this fight other than to say we are vehemently anti-war on this show and pro-peace. He was Brazil's leader for nearly a decade. He was incredibly popular. These are all facts. He left office with an 85% approval rating and he led Brazil to massive economic growth. Um, and Brazil became the sixth largest economy in the world under his watch during those seven years. So those that's what we do know. Of course, he was thrown in jail. Mm -hmm. um, it was later overturned thanks to a corrupt judge, a corrupt judge involved in that. Glenn Greenwald's reporting on that got him ta uh, th taken out of jail, out of prison as a result. Um, he, but he is anti-war. I mean, that's the underline that he is anti-war. He has said as much on Twitter. He has said we cannot move forward while these two countries are at war. And it does not seem like he wants to take his country through any kind of self-sabotage at all when it comes to this conflict that the rest of the world is uh, ready to piggyback. He's denounced Ukraine's aggression against the Donbass. So he's been very outspoken about that. He's denounced the Western NATO propaganda and invoke in provoking Russia. He's been vehemently, he said, look, Zelensky was just as much to blame in this. Um, here's a Guardian piece from a number of months ago. Brazil's ex-president Lula claims Zelensky is equally to blame for the war. And remember, Ukraine doesn't like Lula. They put him on their kill list, by the way, their blacklist. Um, he spoke out against their genocide in the Donbass. Um, so I wonder if Ukraine will rethink their position now. Um, and he also blamed President Biden for this. Like, you know, and uh, he said this, if I win the elections, I hope that the war between Ukraine and Russia is over. Otherwise, we will make an effort of dialogue to establish peace again. We are not interested in any kind of war. Now, according to Glenn Greenwald, it doesn't look like there's an appetite for Bolsonaro to fight this election in Brazil. Bolsonaro, according to Glenn Greenwald, said ha hasn't spoken publicly about the election results, re results overnight. Reports are he hasn't even met with allies or ministers, but he, he went to bed. There seems to be very little appetite among his allies to claim election fraud. Many are, are already acknowledging Lula's win. We'll see how it goes, he says. And in fact, many in his camp had said that they do think it's been a fair fight and they're ready to concede. Yeah. Uh, so we haven't seen it yet at the time that we're um, tonight, but uh, we should soon. Right. So it's also worth remembering that Glenn Greenwald's reporting is what helped get Lula out of prison, as we mentioned, um, because of a corrupt judge and a fake conviction. And then Bolsonaro tried to get people forget this. Bolsonaro tried to get Glenn Greenwald uh, brought up on charges. Uh, and put in prison for his reporting. Uh, that's a fact. Edward Snowden reminds us of that this afternoon. Glenn Greenwald broke the story that freed Lula from prison. For that same reporting, Bolsonaro sought to put Greenwald in prison. He actually brought the charges. And then, of course, today on Twitter, people are like, Glenn must be so sad that Bolsonaro lost and Lula won. And 
you have to remind people, n- no, and that's not the case. Uh, here's what actually happens. So all of that is a sideshow right now. I mean, all of that is a sideshow. What's most important in all of this, of course, is peace talks. Will we see one of the largest countries in the world pressuring President Biden to come to the table for peace talks? We need more of these voices. We need more anti-war voices. And again, we'll look at his social programs. We'll see if he moves that country towards socialism and communism, and we will be critical of it if that unfolds, right? We will look at that. But right now, he's called out President Biden. He's called out President Zelensky. And he said, you guys need to come to the table on this. Um, So will Lula get on the phone to help coordinate peace talk summit between Biden and and Putin and Zelensky? Um, We only have a few days, of course, until Russia is set for a massive operation in Ukraine. Once the ground freezes, thousands of people are going to die as Russia mobilizes its forces. So we could either have a lot more death or we could have peace right now. 300,000 Russian soldiers ready for this massive mobilization once the ground freezes. Does the West want that? We are at a pivot point, Scott Ritter just said, watch. It's a war between Russia and the collective West. Bad news for the collective West. Russia's winning, and they're winning decisively. They've stabilized the front lines. They're reinforcing. Uh, They've absorbed 20% of Ukrainian territory. Uh, They've shut down Ukraine as a nation. Um, NATO's run out of ammunition, run out of weapons. Uh, They're running out of money, and soon they're going to run out of uh, political will to continue. This is the winter hits, and the politicians, the political and economic elite in Europe who promulgated this conflict are going to be held to account by citizens who are tired of being cold and hungry. So where we are, we're we're seeing we're we're at a a pivot point. And over the weekend, Vladimir Putin, speaking through his spokesman, uh, Dmitry Peskov, doubled down on peace negotiations. Um, And they said, first, they need to be held with Washington, right? That's the bottom line. Obviously, Washington has a deciding vote. It's impossible to to discuss anything with Kiev, uh, Peskov said. Basically, he said Kiev has a president, a legitimate Ukrainian president in Zelensky. And it's theoretically possible to reach any agreements with him. But bearing in mind the March experience, these agreements mean nothing because they can be immediately canceled at the, du- the at the dictation from outside. What he's referring to is March and April when they were in Istanbul, Turkey. Yes. Having peace discussions when the U.S. and the British stuck their neck in it and canceled peace talks. And just a few weeks ago when President Putin announced that they would mobilize 300,000 extra troops, he said as much. We had almost a deal in Turkey in the spring, and the West is who tanked it. Um, And so we are ready to come back around, but the West has to participate because we realize who's pulling the strings. So he said we might not be... Isn't that amazing, though? Yeah. Sorry, isn't it amazing, though, that to have, like, when when peace talks between two countries that are at war have to involve the United States, Mm -hmm. who is, you know, not in that war? Yes. That's just amazing to me. Well, of course, it's incredibly telling, right? Because we know who's pulling the strings. It's, yeah, so you know, go home and talk to your dad, and right. we'll see if we can come to an agreement. Dave DeCamp, uh, great writer at uh, antiwar.com, one of my favorite websites. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a website everyone should support if you are vehemently anti-war. Dave DeCamp writes, Russian officials keep saying they're ready for talks. Biden should listen. If he really thinks we're close to nuclear Armageddon, it's criminal not to pursue diplomacy. Um, yeah. And of course, we learned this afternoon that, you, you know, the United States is moving nuclear weapons at to the border with Finland and Russia. Mm-hmm. So if you really are p- pushing towards peace, why are you un, you know pushing more nuclear weapons towards the towards the Russian border? Right. That's not a sign that you're interested in peace because we keep hearing from Washington. Right. We keep hearing from these yahoos in Washington that are telling us we don't see any signs that Putin's ready for for peace. Oh, yeah. So is, is two wrongs make a right then? Like if by that logic, you're moving nuclear weapons to right, at, you know, on their doorstep and you're in, but they're telling us they're physically telling us that they're ready for peace talks. Right. And they have been physically telling us that they have no interest in nuclear strikes. Uh, but, you know, so then we're really ready to flex our muscles and show that we could. We felt like it. So Vladimir Putin. Uh, speaking about these peace talks, and here's what uh, some of the conditions that he's laid out over the past a few days, specifically coming back to this negotiating table. Take a listen. 
He said, stop all military activities immediately, including the war it launched in 2014. Come back to the negotiating table. We are ready to do this. It's been said on many occasions that we are ready for peace. So, but the, the choice of the people of the four regions is not up for discussion. So they're not going to go back on those four regions. Russia will not betray those people, he says. And that's the bottom line. So, hey, you want to have peace talks? We're going to, we're open to these peace talks. We've been saying it now multiple times. We are not going to give up these four regions that have been under attack for the last eight years. Like that ship has sailed. You had an opportunity to come to the table. You had an opportunity to live up to the Minsk agreements over the past eight years. You did not. You continued that shelling of those people. And so we had to step in and we had to make sure and secure those individuals. I mean, they're not really mincing words. We're just reporting what they have said and what they have done. And it all is consistent with what they have continued to say. So, you know, again, we don't have a dog in this fight. We want peace negotiations yesterday. Well, and the same thing can be said of what, you know, I'm, we're, we're pro-peace. We got peace talks unfolding right now in Ethiopia. So we're going to have a follow-up on that this week. We're also looking at what's going on in Armenia and Azerbaijan. Of course, the attacks that have been happening inside of Armenia and the back and forth there. And Russia involved in those peace, ne peace negotiations. And it looks like Armenia is ready to implement Russia's peace plan and get it get it put in place as quickly as possible. In fact, Prime Minister uh, Pashinyan confirmed this on Twitter. He said that he is ready to go along with the Russian Federation proposal for peace, and they will, in fact, meet in Sochi this week. Uh, they are starting just today. Um, this follows the violent uprising in September when dozens of civilians were harmed in an attack that Armenia and Azerbaijan continued to blame each other for. Uh, both sides, you know, have neither side has admitted that they escalated this conflict we reported at the time with journalist Kavor Galmasian. Uh, we encourage you to reach back and watch that. It was an excellent piece. His uh, his nuance and context is fantastic. So um, they are saying that they agree to the deal that has already been placed, but they're going to hammer out the details later this weekend, really, that it was Russia. It was not Nancy Pelosi who brought this peace agreement even though she went there in September, it was instead uh, in Russia. Moved. Oh. Yeah, so it was Nancy. Yeah, Nancy Pelosi goes to Armenia in September, in September mm -hmm. for whatever reason. And we're like, why is she Why is she flying around the world all of a sudden? Like, where's our Secretary of State? But she's flying to Taiwan. She's flying to Armenia. She was racking a lot of uh, frequent flyer miles up during that time. Yes, she did show up right after this conflict on the border. She said we were going to come anyway, but we decided to come here. Um, no one really understood why she came there, but it did seem like at the time the United States wanted the credit for bringing these two nations to peace, but they're not that interested in it right now. Uh, maybe she should come back right now while they're on the verge of success because she hasn't had a great weekend. And so this would, you know, give her another good distraction. 